Um, anyway, we'll have the privilege of a very inspiring and interesting talk by, uh, by uh, Lauri, who will uh, talk about floss in Estonian uh, educational system. So, please welcome. Thank you. Let me just fix the slides. Okay, I'm ready. Blue screen. It was because it was in white screen before, and now it's. <laughs> actually pretty random why I'm now presenting here, <laughs> but I'm happy to be here. And uh, I'm going to try to talk about uh, open source stuff that is happening in Estonia and, uh, and how, how the Estonian, uh, how does it fit um, the bigger picture as well. the button here. <laughs> okay, so the agenda is uh, something like this. I'm going to talk a few words about myself, who, who am I, and uh, uh, what is my background. I'm going to try to debunk myths about Estonia, because I still think that people don't know much about Estonia. Uh, I'm going to talk about the project that we've been doing uh, since March. We migrated uh, some machines uh, from Windows to Linux. I'm going to talk about Estonian IT college, uh, about Estonian e-residence. So that's actually a little slightly out of the open source scope, but uh, I'm going to just show some cool stuff that we have. I'm going to talk about Estubuntu, and I'm going to talk about the future and uh, how you could help. So, yeah, uh, I've been on the internet probably earlier than uh, since earlier than 2004. And I've been using um, open source exclusively past um, five, six, seven years maybe. I've kind of secretly affected development of many projects. So you kind of find my name in, in some of the projects I, I might mention, but it could be even in a way that I was just drinking beer with someone and then some cool stuff happened. <laughs> my favorite programming language is Python. Uh, I think the good thing about me is that I'm familiar with many, many open source projects and technologies. But uh, the bad thing about me is that I'm restless and I get easily bored. And um, I also get that I'm rude. Because when something is crappy, I say it is crappy. And that in a, in a software engineering field, is I think it's very important to say actually what do you think about the thing, how, how does it work, how well does it work. And uh, there's like, there should be less, <clears throat> less of a buffer for being politically correct, because if you know that it's crap, then you, you should say something about it. Uh, yeah, and this, this is pretty much how you can see how restless I am. I've been, uh, I haven't been in, placed in one place for more than a year, I think now, for past, uh, from since uh, 2007. I. When I was doing my uh, bachelor, uh, bachelor of Applied Sciences uh, degree at the Estonian IT College, I had uh, two semesters in Vata, one semester in Greece. Greece, I was working at the Transifex project, for instance, which actually was also an open source project. They do, did localization. They uh, translated uh, many projects using a web application. And then one year I was working at Elion, which is actually Telia's owner sub subsidiary, so basically working for Swedes. And Finns. Uh, after that, I had a nine-month, nine-month military mandatory military service, so we would protect you from Russians. <laughs> 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 and uh, previous year, I was studying at the Technical University of Berlin, uh, which is actually part of this ELT ICT lab program. So one year in one country, a second year in another country, and uh, the second year I'm at KTH uh, Stockholm. And I'm studying uh, embedded systems, which is actually more of a hardware-related thing. But uh, that's the weird thing about me. I want to know as much as I can about anything that has something to do with uh, computers and technology in general. So, a few words about Estonia. 
it's a country here, pretty small country. It's, uh, the population is 1.3 million. Uh, Tallinn is the capital. 70% of people are identify themselves as Estonian. That usually means that they speak Estonian properly. And we have 25% Russians actually there. And um, Estonian language, it has nothing to do with Russian language. It's not a Slavic language. It's actually Finnic language, like Finnish. And I, I especially dug up this map, which actually shows uh, Finnic peoples. And uh, what most people are forgetting that uh, after Second World War, Finland lost a lot of Finnic uh, Finnish-speaking peoples to the Russian Federation and same happened basically with Estonia because there's this what's happening around St. Petersburg is, is pretty uh, there used to be Estonia and Finnish villages there before uh, before Peter the Great uh, founded St. Petersburg and uh, actually here as well there used to be this thing called Livonia which uh, nowadays has only sig uh, historical significance because there is basically no Livonian speaking uh, peoples left anymore. And when you look at the Russian map, then actually these Finnic peoples and related peoples are there as well. And uh, there's more of us actually. But uh, this is like one of the myths I wanted to debunk that like when, when I say that I'm from Estonia, then people assume that I speak Russian, but actually our language is no way related to Russian. So we've been ruled by Danes, Swedes, Russians, Germans, uh, pretty much everybody. So <laughs> now it's like we've been free for, uh, well, we, we counted from the first independence, which was pretty much a long time ago, but actually we've been free for like 20 years. And um, a couple of years ago, well, that was actually many years ago, we had this incident that we removed one of the Soviet monuments from the Tallinn city center, and then we were cyber attacked by from different IP addresses, and uh, the Estonian banks were taken down. Actually, Swedbank was affected. We actually have most of the most of the Estonian banks so far have been there's Swedbank and Seb, which are actually Swedish banks, I think. Yes. So we pay all the loan interest to you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, the, the, these Not companies to me. <laughs> <laughs> these companies were affected by the attacks actually. And after that, we found that, well, we didn't found that, uh, NATO found that this thing called, uh, I don't remember what the abbreviation me meant, but it's something to do with uh, cyber defense, and it's uh, headquartered in Thailand, actually. And, of course, uh, Skype well, is from Estonia, now, unfortunately, it's owned by Microsoft. And Central cyber defense, central excellence. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but I, I can't remember the long... So we just say we just say cyber security center. <laughs> so that's it about uh, Estonia. Now I'm going to talk about what we did this year. Um, so uh, inspired by the Linux project uh, in Munich, we also uh, wanted to try out how Linux would look like on a on a school computers. And uh, in, in March we we. We got an agreement with uh, three schools and two kindergartens that we will try to replace uh, Windows XP with uh, uh, Lubuntu. And actually the driving force behind that was that up to now, Microsoft considered Estonia as a developing country, which roughly meant that we, we paid six euros per XP license and office license, I think, per year per computer, which is fairly low price, right? And uh, after we became a developed country, we are expected to pay 60 euros per year per uh, computer, I, I think. So ten, uh, the price would rise 10 times. And the uh, uh, Minister of Education, I think, they, they basically wanted to investigate like what, if hap what would happen if we would switch uh, from uh, Windows to Linux. So we basically, now we have around 200 PCs that we tried to convert. And of course, that's the unique thing about Estonia is that the budget is always very limited. We don't have that much cash to spend like you have. <laughs> and what I discovered, or what we discovered, is that we still have 90s workflow, which is uh, 
it's, it, it's, it's pretty rough. So, for instance, in one school, there was 40 printers for 80 computers. Every second computer had a printer. And of course, the printers were not the same model. Each printer was a different model. So, you cannot buy toners in a bulk package. You would have to actually get <laughs> different toners for each, each printer. So, there was like serious mismanagement there. Uh, and uh, yeah, so far it has been uh, a lot of sleepless nights and hard work. And uh, this this is highly disturbing actually. <laughs> when somebody ca calls and you see it's the number from like one of the schools or whatever, then it's uh, it's not that fun. <laughs> so the current ar architecture looks uh, something like this. We have a bunch of servers. We have a puppet server. We have a login server. We have a file storage server, authentication server, and a remote desktop server. Uh, people can use their private laptops to connect to the remote desktop server and use the applications there. And uh, from a Windows machine, you can connect with a uh, Swish, for instance. We finally resorted to SSH protocol mainly because of the security. And this, yeah, the security was basically the driving force because uh, we wanted to keep the server central. And what I noticed, for instance, in, in the other migration projects, what they tried to do is they tried to create local servers for each organization. But in case of Estonia, I would say that doesn't make much sense because our uh, wide area networks are really fast. Right now they are unrolling 300 megabit connections to homes. So it, I would say it kind of makes sense to do everything over the internet and kind of skip the local uh, domain controller, whatever, but I think that's going to change, change actually. And yeah, basically uh, the workstations, these are the machines that are running Ubuntu 12.4. They just get the configuration from Puppet. Once the uh, configuration is applied, you'll have all the services up and running and you can, you know, start using the computer. <coughs> so, yeah, pitfalls. So, first of all, I think the main, main pitfall was that uh, user, users were not trained how to report problems. It, it seems like obvious thing, how you would do it, you know, you say, this is my computer, this is the user account, this is the folder I'm trying to access, this is the file in the folder, blah, 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 blah. But it's not obvious, and uh, these kind of things need to be trained. Uh, LibreOffice also, uh, actually it seems that LibreOffice trainings have been very successful in Estonia. People are very much interested, even Windows users, they want to know. And uh, it somehow contradicts the, the myth that uh, there is no demand for LibreOffice, but actually it's the other way around, that people are very much interested, but there's no people who would train them. And uh, yeah, POSIX file system permissions also, that was a... You know, Windows users expect everybody, everything to be CH mode 777, basically. <laughs> so you can over, overwrite other person's files and whatever in a shared folder, for instance. So, yeah, that needs to be trained as well. And uh, for the sysadmins, this, this is actually a very sensitive topic. They feel uh, attacked by you. Mm. You're going to take their bread away because people rely on that guy who, who is an, in, the, in that school. And you're going to go to him like, yeah, we're going to put everything to the servers. You know, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. And uh, one of the guys felt uh, very insecure about that. And it, it took a lot of time and a lot of ping-ponging emails and trying to understand what his concerns were when he actually kind of was like, okay, do it. <laughs> so he's like, um, I didn't, for some reason, I didn't expect it, but um, it happened. Um, a comment? Yeah, I think that's a, a really important problem because many times, you know, if you do it the wrong way and, and, and the way that it's often done, when you centralize, mm -hmm. you actually dismiss the competence, the local competence yep. that has been built up. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, you know, in Swedish schools, that has happened all over when you sent they centralized the, the services for security reasons yep. and things like that, and it was done at the on the conditions of the admin, mm -hmm. not on the condition of the educationalists. Yeah. Uh, so it's a real problem, and uh, so there are grounds for, for people reacting on that. But yeah. really, what First, for, uh, I, I didn't think about it, but you know, 
then I bumped into the wall and then I tried to work over the problem and you know. So you really have to empower yeah. uh, the local people to have uh, influence even if you centralize. Yeah. And uh, what should have been, what should have been done more better was uh, obviously analysis of already existing hardware. And we had like Canon printers, which Canon printers are horrible. <laughs> There's like three different driver stacks for Canon printers in general. One of them just crashes. I don't know why. I have a cron uh, job which will kill it every hour. <laughs> uh, we had these uh, smart boards. Uh, so it's uh, this. Um, Touch, um, touch. I mean, it's not a screen, but uh, touch uh, interfaces, and you put the beamer on the screen. Most of the drivers were are unusable. For instance, one driver was just doing CH mod seven 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 for TTY USB zero every second. Sounds like very incompetent programmers behind the drivers. Uh, but yeah. Otherwise, like, did you manage to fix that? We're still talking with the developers, yeah, okay. but it's just you know this never-ending ping-pong, and uh, the best part about one of the one of the hardware vendors was that the salesman in Estonia he was convinced that it's supported under Linux. You know, it says that it's supported under Linux. I tried to explain him that you know first of all the uh, end-user application like differs completely from the Windows version, so it always de developing completely separate uh, applications and the drivers do not work, and so forth and so forth. And then it was like, he felt offended that I was, I was trying to do debugging work for him, you see? And, and that's, I, I didn't expect this kind of uh, resistance. I, I was thinking that I was like doing the good thing, you know, reporting the bugs, you know, but they felt offended because of that actually. Uh, I had like so many long phone calls about that and uh, now we're finally in the stage where we're talking with the developer and uh, getting somewhere. So future plans. Uh, we want to switch to Samba 4 actually. Samba 4 is a pretty cool thing. Um, because uh, most of the current solutions you use LDAP and Kerberos and uh, Samba 3, you basically need three different applications and then you need to tweak all of them to make them work together but what Samba 4 does is uh, it sort of tries to emulate Windows Domain Controller so they have their own database which has LDAP interface and uh, a proper hooking mechanism with uh, Kerberos and DNS system and uh, obviously file server as well so uh, I, we were talking with these um, Estonian educational network uh, guys that uh, they were uh, developing a sort of user management system so you could import users like let's say you accept uh, 200 students to your school you get immediately data from the uh, one of the educational information systems that these uh, schools are now in your school so you just click a button and users will be automatically generated uh, in your local Samba for domain controller so that's what they want to do and uh, here is also like one of the funny things about Estonia is that we started the whole project in March. Those guys started developing the same thing in April. They were guys somewhere in the middle who knew about what I was doing and what they were doing. I didn't know about that. So I was doing the same thing as well. So in September, we had two competitive solutions for the same problem. I did it slightly differently and they are doing uh, it also slightly differently but we're going to eventually switch to this system so it's called Candient I, I don't know what it actually means but the point is that uh, it's sort of a unified authentication mechanism for, for, for schools and educational services and it's sort of like on the web it's, it looks like a OAuth and, but uh, from my perspective it looks like a, a mechanism to import users from uh, governmental databases to the your local Samba 4 database. And what they want to do as well is to proxy Eduron to these uh, Samba controllers. So eventually it should be the smooth system that, you know, same username, same password, works everywhere for Eduron, for logging into the Ubuntu machines. And the cool thing about Samba 4 is that it also works for the Windows machines. 
so you can have actually hetero heterogeneous system uh, in the school. Some co computers using Windows and some computers just with uh, Ubuntu. And yeah, obviously we need to upgrade to Ubuntu 12.4. And one of the really key issues is that uh, people are stuck in the 90s workflow, which means that you have your word processing software, you compose a document there, which is completely contextless. It's just random text, basically, from a, a computer science perspective. And then you just print it. And then, same thing all over again. What we did is that we introduced the digital signatures in Estonia. So now, instead of printing and signing, you can sign the PDF or the doc file or the ODT file. But what I would like to see is to get rid of this 90s workflow and put all the data into databases, information systems, so it would be accessible from also with a, uh, in, a, in a mechanic way, using APIs and stuff like that. And yeah, one of the most annoying things is we should discu discourage printing from an ecological point of view, from economical point of view, and I mean, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> And uh, my goal actually here is to make the question of uh, operating system irrelevant because if we adopt web services, it doesn't matter what's the operating system. And uh, with the Samba 4, uh, you get the Kerberos authentication and single sign-on. If it works for Windows and Ubuntu, again, it doesn't matter. So this is sort of the ideal architecture, what I'm aiming at. Puppet will remain there, Syslog will remain there. We want to switch to something that can be synced offline, so that would be on cloud, for instance, because SSHFS relies on the internet connection while you access the files. But with on cloud, you can actually cop basically copy the files to the local machine, do some changes when you're offline. When you're online again, you get them uh, synced back to the cloud. Uh, but there were some uh, bunch of issues with on cloud uh, that I'm not going to go into detail right now, and. This is the things that we're, we're going to put into the local network. This will probably be a NAS box, something running Debian. Put two disks in it, turn it into a local uh, local area uh, file server, and it will include authentication and uh, group membership and all that stuff. So the school secretary can basically log into that box and import the users from the educational information systems, and I will be just managing the computers. So I really want to get rid of all the authentication crap. Yes. Uh, so, um, how how large a system is this? Is this the entire country, or is this one school, or, or one city, or what, what is it? So, what I was thinking is that I I would like to keep central puppet, central syslog, probably a cluster of own cloud uh, machines, a cluster of RDP machines. This will be local per uh, per uh, organization. And I think it should scale because uh, uh, this resolves the uh, user ID depletion. Because if we would have central LDAP server, you can't make more than 65,000 users, basically. Which actually should be resolved. Why, why can't we have 64 bit integers for user IDs yet? I, I don't understand that, actually. Probably some uh, compatibility issues. But I, I think that should scale, basically. Puppet is not that resource intensive. Syslog neither. Own cloud is the is the thing that should be clustered, and RDP as well. Just have some redundant servers and do some port uh, jargon. And yeah, Samba 4 would be local then. And Samba 4 is actually pretty easy to manage. I, I just did it once. There's this com command uh, Samba 4 provision. It will set up all the services so they would work in sync. And basically, you just need to do one more command to set up uh, Kerberos, I think. So, I think that should be doable. So, uh, I will finish with the uh, project now. If you want to ask about I will I can tell you more after the presentation. And I'm going to talk about, actually, generally speaking, the IT education in, uh, in Estonia. So, <clears throat> in 1996, uh, I think the president uh, announced that we're going to do this Tigrihupta, which means a tiger leap. It was like a, a program that covered the whole Estonia that, yes, we will upgrade all the computers, we will connect everybody to the internet, blah, 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 blah. 
uh, I, I would say this was like the highlight of the Estonian IT because then there were a lot of investments to the um, machinery. They like all the all the schools got new equipment, uh, good internet connections, and so forth. But you know now they say that the tiger is sleeping. <laughs> and uh, a couple of years ago, I think uh, this uh, was announced in 2007. So it's like programming tiger. Uh, this is a program to uh, First, they were just developing materials to teach uh, programming in uh, primary school and high school. And since uh, last year, they've been uh, actually applying it. So before, they were uh, doing the materials and uh, teaching the teachers. And now they're finally uh, teaching the children. And uh, basically, the program is something like uh, uh, scratch-based uh, programming for little kids, Lego Mindstorms, I think. And uh, for advanced ones, there is uh, a web development, which is, I think, uh, based on Ruby. And there's a lot of Python, I remember. I think, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of different other uh, programs as well. So this is the uh, Information Technology Foundation for Education. This is the, actually the organization that kind of covers all the programs. And under that, we have also the Estonian Information Technology College. A couple of years ago, we turned 1,000 in binary. <laughs> so now it's, it's actually a pretty young university. Uh, it's like more than 10 years, I think, now. Uh, I studied there, and I'm going to teach there, hopefully, uh, starting from uh, autumn. You have excellent uh, graphical designers. Those are very good. Yeah, these are just freshly re uh, redesigned. Uh, everybody was uh, uh, were surprised why, why they put the hashtags in. Obviously, because of Twitter. <laughs> so, a few words about Estonian IT College. Uh, right now, it's, it's just a, a Bachelor of Applied Sciences uh, College. Uh, I graduated it um, many years ago, and uh, there's basically there was a system uh, system uh, IT system development uh, curriculum and uh, IT systems administration, and also technical communication and uh, some other stuff as well. But you know. All the good guys went to the IT system development, of course. And um, basically, that's why I'm in Sweden. I'm, I'm doing my uh, master thesis so I could teach. That that was the main sense of why why I why I entered the master's program. And uh, starting from autumn, we will start with a DevOps curriculum, and uh, it should be uh, as modern as uh, fancy as you know a proper DevOps curriculum should be. I'm going to be doing there probably uh, virtual private networks and firewalling and Python and uh, obviously now authorization and authentication courses as well. And uh, the main thing is that it's open source friendly. We have triple boot classes for instance with Mac machines so you can boot Mac, Ubuntu, Windows on them. Um, like all the equipment is fancy and stuff and uh, if you know someone who who's about to enter the university, I highly recommend that you suggest our college, of course, uh, because uh, yeah, you can continue in master studies with this uh, diploma, usually. And uh, yeah, we had academy, the KD community gathering in uh, that's actually right. It was 2012. There's typo there, and. What I suggested already earlier here is that if you want to host open source events, regardless of, uh, I already heard that the Gen 2 something something they want to do uh, somewhere, so I suggested we'll do it in Tallinn because it's cheap and I can get you free rooms because um, there's not a lot of activity going on in Estonia related to open source and I would uh, gladly greet people who would want to do it there. The, as I said, the main benefit is that you get the rooms for free, all the equipment there, recording, and uh, accommodation and uh, catering is, is, is pretty cheap compared to Sweden and Norway, of course. Yeah, as I said, random topic selection, this is another random topic. So we have the Estonian uh, ID card. It's a government-issued uh, hardware token. It contains two RSA keys. There's an authentication key, signature key, and what we changed in the law is that the signature is legally binding. If you sign something with this key, home loan, 
buy an apartment, whatever, it's binding, and you're screwed if this key gets stolen. But fortunately, it's in the card. Hopefully, it's not nowhere else, because uh, as a convenience, they uh, pre-generate the keys on in the card. So yes, technically, there is a slight possibility that RSA keys are somewhere else, but I hope they're not. <laughs> Because the ideal solution would be that you have to generate the key by yourself and then present a certificate, sign that yes, this is my certificate, but obviously you can't do this for, uh, for most of the people because they are not uh, technically adept to do that. And uh, in order to have high uh, technology uh, usage, you sort of have to do stuff like this. Uh, because 95 of the people in Estonia do tax declaration online using ID cards. Yeah, and since all of it is standardized, you can set up your own web server to authenticate with ID card. So I've done that, that was pretty cool. And uh, now what was announced a couple of weeks ago is that anyone can become an Estonian Air resident, which means that you'll get a card like this, except without an image, because it's not, uh, it's not an ID, it's not a document, but you get to use the electronic component to register a company in Estonia, for instance. I'm going to talk about this uh, in a second. How do you read? Get, read the keys from the card? Do you put it in some kind of reader? Yes. So we have uh, USB card readers. Only difference is that Germany manufactures their card readers, and the card readers cost, what was it, 300 euros? But we just use some random Atmega chip based Chinese card readers, which cost five euros <laughs> so yeah I, I know that this is like you know the security and uh, uh, I mean the security and uh, ease of use are always in conflict it's like a more of a philosophical question it's like we have but we have a working solution and it's you know being used we can always make it better and if you're paranoid then you can order that 300 euro card reader <laughs> So, uh, uh, about the software stack that runs on the machines, so uh, it's mostly open source, well actually it is completely open source, but it's mostly G LGPL licensed, there are other, some, some of the components are, are a little bit more liberally licensed as well. And one of the serious issues is that the stack is complex, and it depends on external uh, software, for instance last macOS upgrade broke the compatibility with Estonian ID card, and uh, it's funny because the, in this macOS release, they introduced also di digital signature, which you give on your touchpad, which doesn't have any cryptographical value. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the problem is that it breaks easily. It relies on like the whole stack. And um, for instance, the local utilities are Qt based. Uh, I can actually show them. So, well, yeah, I don't have a card reader here, but this is what the utility looks like. If you plug in the card, it will show you a picture here, your name, whether your card is valid or not. And you can use this program, for instance, to sign documents. Yeah? I, I can see that you can change the language. Yes, how, of so what course. Are cool. nice. All right. We have most of the stuff is available in English as well. Because obviously the latest uh, Estonian policy is to try to export uh, uh, as much as stuff as possible, because it would generate extra net revenue for the uh, for the government. And um, one more question. Yeah. So is this thing open source? I mean, yes. We could we localize it for Sweden? Yes, yeah, sure. Cool. This uh, this is uh, Qt based open source, and uh, yeah, this is the last point here. Software is uh, software development process is being digitized, which means basically that the Sony ID card software development saga is nasty and complex. But fortunately, what they did in the beginning is they wrote into the contract that it has to be open source. It has to have a version control system. But for instance, they didn't specify. I think that the version control has to be public. <laughs> and right now there is no public bug tracker. And, you know, it's, it's always trying to leverage between the company who is being paid to do that crap, because actually nobody wants to do it. <laughs> it's pretty complex. It, as I said, it's, it's composed of many components which need to work together. And uh, trying to balance it with the, the interests of people who know how software development should be and what is like the ideal way to do it. 
and yeah, for instance, the browser plugin initially was written in Java and crashed the whole browser, and now we have a JavaScript plugin, so that's significantly better. And what's happening actually now is that uh, one of the developers was hired, uh, one of OpenSC developers were hired by the Estonian government, and uh, um, the main reason was that he has to push the standards. For instance, uh, there was this uh, uh, World Wide Web Consortium meeting in in, in US, uh, I think last week, and Martin went there to tell the web crypto guys basically that, dudes, you need to put in hardware token support. Because these guys, they just wanted to do RSA algorithm wrappers in JavaScript or something like that. Like really simple stuff. But Martin told them that, hey guys, we also need hardware, hardware token support. So if you plug in a smart card or USB token, that you should be able to sign with these things as well. And he's, uh, one of his uh, main uh, jobs is to push all the development into Git. So it would be public, all the changes would be visible and so forth and so forth. But it's, it's very complex to coordinate this stuff between a government who is, who is the customer in this case, in this case uh, a company who is developing that for their profit, and you know, open source community who is angry at everybody. <laughs> so, e-residents, uh, as I said, now you can all apply for the smart card, so you could do business uh, in Estonia. We already have, like, most of the records are online. And there's this thing called X-Road, which we recently exported to Finland. It's a gateway to access the different registers. So I can just show you this thing, for instance. So uh, this is uh, one of like mashup web applications they did for... <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, that's one of the mashup applications they did for... Uh, for the using the X road and like this is like I just logged in with a mobile ID. We also have mobile ID support, and it just aggregates data from different registers. Like for instance, the yes, my health card insurance is present. This is my family doctor, which is kind of creepy that I see this from here. This is actually a lie. I have an European medical insurance card, which is actually valid as well. I don't have a boat. I don't have a driver's license, and I don't have a car. Uh, I have a, everybody has a governmental email address. And you can set it to be forwarded to your private email address. Um, still paying money for you, you Swedish bastards. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I have um, military uh, service obligations. Uh, password is valid until this time. I have also ID card. Well, actually, the other way around. Everybody is actually uh, required to have ID card, but passport is now optional. I'm single. I don't. I don't have any kids. My birthday, my address, uh, my company, my real estate, and my exam results. Mm. But this is weird, right? Educational spirit, right? I'm not sure what that means. So yeah, this is like one example of what you can do if you have all the data. The, the, and that's what I'm saying. The data is not central in one data center. It is actually distributed uh, between uh, the, uh, the organizations that are responsible for that data. For instance, the health insurance data is in the health uh, whatever whatever organization. But the X road is just a gateway to get data from there in a standardized format. Yeah, as I said, 95% uh, Estonia, uh, Estonians already do their tax uh, declaration online. Uh, last year, uh, it was my first experience using a fax machine in Berlin. I've never used fax machine in my life before. I don't understand the whole... It's like Stone Age. <laughs> and you were informed when fax went off to leave. <laughs> yeah. But the weird thing is that Germans consider it as a... They have, I think they have a law that says that it's legally binding. Yes. Which is it's really strange. <laughs> you, can't, you can't have a legal binding with a with signed PDF, but you have legally bind when you uh, send a, 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 a fax. So you can send email, it's not valid. You take the same document, uh, uh, take it to the fax, and it's valid. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yes. We, uh, we have a, a record for registering a company. It's 20 minutes. Plug in ID card, type in the company name, have some checkboxes, check which kind of uh, organization do you want to have, click uh, sign, insert uh, pin 2, and you have a company. Yeah, 
And now we get to the community part. We have Estobunto, which is... Um, uh, I was participating in it. I'm, I think I'm going to go over time a little bit. <laughs> we based it on Kubuntu because at that time Kubuntu had uh, better Estonian localization support. And uh, now we're actually trying to do all the desktops and uh, we've kind of attracted a lot of young kids from, from high schools and uh, there's a lot of people contributing and it's, it's rather messy. But in the beginning it was like three guys, me and two of my friends. And basically what we did is we took Kubuntu, switched it to Estonian, installed ID card software, uh, installed Codex because we don't give a crap of, about the US patents. Um, <laughs> we, did, we got some contract with Skype that they allowed, it, uh, allowed us to put the Skype on the uh, ESO. We put Flash there, Java there. So it's like basically you boot it up, everything works, you can go to online web services and whatever. And now we've done this install fests, is an Estonian word, I couldn't find a good translation for this. Uh, that we've been basically uh, organizing these events like where people can come and we will help them to install Estobuntu on the machines and they could start uh, doing whatever they want. Yeah, and now I think this is like the tipping point in a sense that I've been talking like five years that we should have monthly meetings and uh, have businesses like who have open source interests that we should gather under one umbrella and blah 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 and it's like you know all deja vu all over again and uh, there are so many non-functional NGOs which deal with like NGO Estonian Linux and MGO, NGO Estonian BSD and it's like there's like a bunch of them uh, most of them are being liquidated now uh, most of the, these guys have actually kids and they don't really care anymore uh, they don't have time, they're working, whatever. And uh, right now we have Alvatal, which is like, um, let's say, like center of open source solutions or something like that. And uh, last discussion we had on 24th of October was that we need to basically get funding, we need to employ a lawyer, a copywriter, somebody who represents the companies. So they would basically produce promotional materials about the companies that exist in Estonia who already do open source stuff and you know where the experts are basically and uh, get the money into the right, right direction and one of the good uh, ideas what one of the guys had is that we need to uh, uh, basically tell the government how they should order IT solutions because right now you get this sort of schizophrenic uh, decision made on a governmental level so you're the next one right? no, okay. no? And uh, sort of the reason why I'm here is that uh, we need cooperation with the uh, Finnish uh, Center of Open Source Solutions. That, that is actually how we got Academy to Tallinn. Uh, I just went to Academy in Tampere, we were drinking beer, really drunk, and I said to this guy, that, hey dude, we should do it in Tallinn. And he said, hell yeah. And he kept his promise, we did it. So I would gladly meet uh, Open Source uh, Sweden uh, guys. I heard that there's one guy at least here somewhere. No. No, not anymore. No. <laughs> okay. And uh, get you know uh, basically get some labels on the homepage that we are actually existing thing and we do stuff because like there are we have a bunch of people who already do a lot of stuff that has that is mainly open source and uh, there's money in the business and so forth. So here, yeah, I already said half of this stuff. Um, if you're uh, if you're bored and you don't have anything to do. Come to Estonia. You can uh, help us to distribute the workload. We want to turn this to into, into a e-residence uh, platform. So basically, we want to make it international. Have actually more languages on the ISO and uh, have foreigners using Estonian e-services as well. And um, yeah, we need we need people to the center of open source solutions. If you have money, I think nobody has anything about, uh, against money. So you can invest in common sense, and that's actually one of the things that I've noticed is that government and other organizations they do things that don't make sense, and we need more common sense solutions. Like for instance, getting rid of the printers, use digital signatures, and make everything web based so it's not stuck in one platform. And give us some good reason why you why you should move to Estonia. We have now three megabit, three hundred megabit connections being rolled out. We have electric car charging network. Uh, that covers the whole country. Uh, we had we sold Japan some pollution quotas or something, and they actually made sensible thing with the money. 
they built electric car charging network. Uh, food is uh, still cheap. Salaries are low. We just crossed the, the thousand euro month uh, threshold. So, so uh, yeah, but there's a long way to go to reach reach the Nordic level. And yeah, it's easy to start a company. And if you have savings for six months in Sweden, I suppose you could live off for more than a year in Estonia with that money. And from this slide, I'm not going to talk much about this. I'm just saying that I'm looking for an internship in Sweden. I have this contract agreement uh, with, a, with the scholarship agreement that I need to stay in Sweden from January to May, and I need an internship for that time. So, if you think if you found me an interesting person, I would gladly talk with you after this session. And I've got some good slides in the beginning, in the end. So there is this running joke that Estonia will never be a Nordic country. <laughs> so I've got some cool ideas. First, we could rename the country to Estland, which would sound Nordic. We should, <laughs> we should adapt the cross flag. There has been really beautiful cross flag design that I've seen. So we can export the whole e-residence uh, stuff. So we can cash in on the taxes from all foreigners as well. And there's this picture that we've kind of begged Finland that, please, Finland, help us join the Nordics. But Finland is just drinking in Estonia, and he doesn't really care. <laughs> and uh, there's another slide. So this is the Estonia with the cross flag design. You know, you have the Nordics there. The, the Sweden, Sweden is dreaming that you know Nordics is the real Nordics. It doesn't have any four countries in it. And then the nightmare of Sweden is that Estonia changes the flag to the cross flag and tries to. Uh, tries to become one of the Nordics. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks for your attention.